your first love? Was it arts or the sciences? My first love was actually ballet, like every other little girl. I mean, what little girl doesn't dream of being a ballerina, right? So I'd say my first love was ballet, but it's funny because from ballet came my love from the sciences. How did that like arise? Ballet and sciences. Because I was a dancer and I'll be completely honest, I was not the best dancer. I did not receive the sufficient training that I needed to catch up with other dancers when I moved to a really big ballet school. So what I would do was I would watch the other dancers, the dancers who were better than me. And I'd notice these little things like you want to turn faster, you move your arms closer to your body. You want to jump, kailangan mo magbuelo. Things like that. And I would do that, but I'd also be interested in the why. Why do I turn faster when I move my arms closer to myself? And that question of why, why do I move this way? Why do certain actions cause my dancing to look this way? That led me to study kinematics, classical physics, which, you know, from there, tuloy tuloy na. That's how I got into physics in the first place. But other than that, um, so sort of a side story. The other thing there was I just really, really liked comic books as a kid. I like comic books. Marvel, DC. Marvel, Marvel all the way. I grew up on Spider Man. Like I, I used to, you know, the Sunday, the Sunday papers with the comic strips on them. I used to cut up the Spider Man comics and paste them on a scrapbook. Because scrapbooking was like a big deal when I was a kid. And I used to follow Spider-Man. And of course, there's so much physics in play there. But mostly it was because I really, really loved the Hulk. And as you know, the Hulk is a nuclear physicist. So you know how it is in Mean Girls. Bruce Banner was a nuclear physicist. So I became a nuclear physicist. How old were you when you were a ballerina and just starting to like, hmm, science? And got curious <laughs> about the sciencey side of the ballerina <laughs> art? I was 13. So 13, curiosity started the sciences. How about nung, nung like when you were, siyempre, teenage years, though, I guess for all of us, it's, it's an era where we start trying to find our place in the world and, you know, try to not only or try to not only find our place in the world, but also, you know, know ourselves more. So like ballerina and then singing, our knees, wushu, yeah. drama. So habang in-explore mo to sila, tong mga nasa arts, arts stuff na to, how did you intersect it or like balance it out with your budding interest in the sciences, the hard sciences? Well, for me, it was very easy because as I mentioned, my interest in physics stemmed from wanting to be a better ballet dancer. So the things I was in was very physical, were very physical. So ballet, wushu, arnis, and all of those, you're going to need physics to understand it. So in a way, it went hand in hand with it, you know, mm-hmm. so it wasn't, it didn't, I don't know. Now that I'm looking back at it, it never felt like a separate area in my life. It was just one of those things that you kind of needed to know. If you wanted to be a better dancer, you wanted to be a better fighter, you needed physics and I would study that. And the reason... Sorry, go on. No, no, I cut you off. I'm listening. Go ahead. So, um, the reason really why I ended up taking physics in college was because I wanted to further understand my craft through physics. And then from there, it just became something else. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, girl. Because you've like applied physics in arts. Is like when I hear applied physics, ang na na imagine ko agad is like the other, you know, nuclear stuff or some, you know, something related to physics na talagang super hardcore science. But in your case, it was like a really uh, innovative approach to the science to better understand your ballet skills or you know, our knees will shoe, then you just started to get into the science of it and, yeah. you know, get a better result. Wow. Wow. So, 
<laughs> really, really impressed. I'm not laughing because it's laughable. I'm just glad it was like, oh, this is this is, this is really. It's it's I I, I like stuff na unconventional and that approach. The it it just makes me glad, you know. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, so from that, so ballerina na sa performing arts, and all of this. By the way, nakita ko dun sa yung like your Miss Universe, uh, I guess a uh, uh, promo vid. Ah, um, uh, the introduction video. Yeah. Um, how was that run? If we could just cover it a bit, how how was your run, uh, nung mag you know your uh, during your attempt uh, Miss Universe pageant? Because I saw na and dami mong accomplishments and such, but then during the top seventy five, I don't understand that. Me personally, I thought you just you should have you know made it past that because just looking at what you're capable of. Because me personally, I'm not a fan of pageants, like beauty pageants. But, you know, I, I just, I understand it. It's just like I'm not into it. Because for me, maybe this is just me as a guy, you know, it's beauty. It's really hard to judge it. Mm. Because I don't know what they're looking at, by the way. Because do you all look graceful. You all look beautiful, and I was like, "How do you even like?" It's like splitting hairs, maybe. And I don't. I'm not. Maybe I'm not the type of person to slip. I mean, to split the hairs, especially with it, when it comes to like selecting a winner for such a competition. Is like if you've got there in the final stage, you probably would have killed it, answered all of all of the questions, especially with you know <laughs> all your okay. smarts and wits, but. You know, things didn't, uh, I guess, didn't go as planned. And for some reason, majority, they did, they did, you know, the majority of the people who follow the pageant didn't seem to think that you deserve to be on the top 75. I mean, I mean, it was, it's just personally, it's just ineffable for me. I couldn't believe it. But for your side of the story, for your end, how did it affect you, your learnings, or what? What did you, I guess, pick up from that experience? Honestly, it got me more into my feminine energy. I don't harbor any ill feelings towards Miss Universe for not making it past the the part that I did. I don't hold any ill will towards that. I've learned a lot from the girls. And there are so many aspects of beauty, both internal and external. And I, I know that I'm beautiful in my own way. It is a competition just because I didn't make it through top 75 does not mean I'm any less beautiful, does not mean that others are more beautiful. We all have our own beauty. It's just that I feel I was not ready for the competition because I've kind of just been like doing my own thing and, you know, focusing on other aspects that I wasn't. Medyo hilaw pa ako in terms of actually getting in a competition. So I think that that's one area where I'm trying to improve because I do intend to try again after a while. The, the, the Miss Universe competition has removed its age limits. So, you know, that means I can kind of chill out a little bit and really focus on myself so that when I'm completely prepared, I can come back in. But yeah, um, Miss Universe has really taught me a lot of things, taught me a lot about sisterhood, especially because you would expect that pageants are all like, you know, catty, bitchy, I'm sorry. But that's a stereotype of pageantry, right? But my experience in pageantry has been nothing but absolutely nice. The girls are all so supportive of each other. And I think my biggest takeaway from Miss Universe was really the importance of sisterhood and how beautiful sisterhood could be. That just because we're all competing for the same crown does not mean that we have to be enemies. So post Miss U, what did you do after that? Did you uh, chill out or did you still like hustle and started the grind? No rest for the wicked type of thing. After Miss U, I went back to sciences, honestly, because I felt that I think the biggest reason I did not get that far in Miss U was I wasn't ready, you know, like wasn't physically and mentally ready. And I felt that the best way for me to be ready and really have that self-confidence and radiate that energy was if I was confident in my skills. Take note that 
Miss U, when I joined Miss U, I was a fresh grad. So I didn't know anything of the world. I mean, I knew, I kind of knew how the world worked, but you get what I mean. Like I'm mm. fresh out of college. So I figured I should have a little bit more world experience, understand how, how the world works and really work on my sciences. And that's what I did right after I just went right back to work. So like after the uh, grind, mo, went back to studies, nuke physics, uh, is there any other areas ng physics you like considered first or was it really from the get-go nuke physics? Before I entered college, I already knew that I was going to be in nuclear physics. It's funny because people were asking like, you know, you're a freshman and they're like, oh, what do you plan to do with your degree? And I said, I want to join the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. And that's what I did. I ended up interning there for a while. Then as you know, I trained in reactor engineering for nuclear physics. What was the like hook for you for nuclear physics? What was the, I guess, X factor of nuclear physics that really pulled you in versus the other areas? It's just the most interesting for me. And it's the one that I understand the most. I'll be honest, Major Mababao. But I started getting into nuclear physics because of the Hulk. <laughs> because when I was a kid, I really, really liked the Hulk. And, you know, the Hulk is a nuclear physicist. And, you know, when you read comics, you kind of want to know, like, oh, is this true? Is this legit? Is this really how the world works? So I kind of ended up in that rabbit hole. And then that interest just spawned into me wanting to be a nuclear physicist. And when we took it up, like, you know, high school physics and then college physics, it's just the part that I understood the most, really. Nuclear physics was like really, you know, small particles and such. I know some terms yeah. familiar with them, but I don't really know how the math works during those. But again, yeah, um, the, thing, the thing with quantum physics is that you have to completely change your worldview for it because classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, they kind of operate, they operate differently. So you have to completely shed how, like for example, in classical mechanics, if I'm looking at my dog right now, dog is there. There's no question about it. But then in quantum mechanics, you don't know if a particle is there or not. If you don't so, look at it. That, yeah, so it, it's very saying? different. Yeah, but even if you like look at it, it's less of a, it's there and more of like there's a higher probability of it being there and it's never actually there until you actually measure it, if that makes sense. So it, it's very different. You really have to change how you think about it. So, yeah. It's like some, you know, the it, it's, it sounds to me that the deeper you get with the hard sciences, you get into some, you know, paradoxical realm because the way you just described it to me, it was like, you know, if, If you're not looking at it, it's not there. But if you look at it, then you can measure it. And once you measure it, it kind of manifests itself into reality. It's it's but, more of like, but like there's there's a bunch of particles, and you could never know for certain where each particle is unless you measure the probability of where it is. You get what I mean? <laughs> Actually, no. I gotta be honest. Just like it's really, but it's it's like it's so fascinating to hear from an actual, you know, physicist like you. You're measuring probabilities. You're not measuring exact, uh, yeah, exact items, right? So, well, I'd I, I, I'd I'd love to ask more about how you measure probabilities, but I'll probably gonna be so lost. In the yeah, there's a lot we have to get into there. Um, it involves like Schrodinger's equation, quantum dynamics. It, it's not really something you, you. Um, I don't know if I can explain it in one go. <laughs> I, I, I bet, I bet. So I guess I'll just um, point to something a bit more practical then. That's sure. also a big part of my interest: quantum computing. The, uh, the new generation of computers, how does it, like for a layman like me, I know that quantum computing can be, you know, faster and is just like a really uh, roided up version of the current type of supercomputers that we have. 
But if you could, I guess, explain it to me and the listeners a bit simply, what, why is like a quantum computer more, I mean, what makes the more compute, uh, what makes the quantum computer more efficient than this like current computers that we have right now, even though we really, really have fast computers? What th- would you happen to know? The thing about quantum computing is that it uses quantum mechanical effects. So, for example, um, quantum interference, superposition, stuff like that. And then it, it applies that into computing so that it gets faster and it's more efficient. That's basically how it works. And also, the other thing about it is that it can store a lot more information. So, for example, they have qubits and these can form these can hold a lot more information than a usual bit that they have in classical computing Mm. so i think that's like the easiest way i can explain it Mm. so it allows you to solve like really 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 hard problems that would have to go through a lot of processing data in a regular computer it uses quantum effects and quantum like such as like superposition or entanglement to be able to run that faster and store more energy, more energy, more information. <laughs> but if we got like quantum computers, since we already have it, you know, them and in their, I guess, infancy, I guess Google and all the tech giants are using it right now, maybe secretly, maybe not. What kind of problems, like modern problems, do you think will be much more efficiently solved by implementing some quantum computing infrastructure? I feel like one thing that it could be really useful in would be maybe disaster control. Because since it's really fast, you can do simulations better. And you can simulate different... What's the word? You can simulate different conditions in different areas. So let's say, for example, you have a mountain and you want to find out like, oh, what will happen if there's a an earthquake in this mountain? And then with quantum mechanic, quantum computing, you can simulate that faster. So you can find out that, oh, there's this village in this area that's really going to be hit by the landslide. So you could further, so it would be easier for you to be able to, to take care of that situation faster. Other than that, you can also simulate chemical systems or I think another thing it could do is it could be helpful in its finance, really, like in, portfolio optimization. In what way of uh, like portfolio optimization for like financial institutions, you mean like corporations and such? Yeah, I'm not too familiar with the ins and outs of it because I'm personally not in finance, but I'm aware that that is one of the one of the things that quantum computing could really help. Pretty interesting. You said something about disasters and the speed at which quantum computing will be able to simulate uh, these, I guess, impending dooms for you know people, essentially globally. Like, how fast or how efficient would you say, in terms of like ten x, two x, from like right now? I, I guess um, we're, we're I, doing it right now, but with quantum like technology, how how fast do you think? I don't think I can speak on that because quantum computing is honestly not my level of expertise. I am aware of it, especially since I am in quantum mechanics, but I'm more in the nuclear side. So I quantum computing is more of an engineering thing also. So it's not really my field of expertise, so I can't give you actual numbers. Sorry. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. I was just curious. I mean... Yeah, I guess for the listeners, if we got some quantum engineer, I mean quantum computer engineers listening to us, could you comment it on the comment section how much faster? Yeah, I don't want to say anything because, again, I'm not too familiar with this and I might end up spreading misinformation. So if I'm not too familiar with the topic, I'd rather not comment on it. Fair enough, fair enough, Frankie. So, like... uh. All right, moving on from quantum computer, a bit more related, right? Since we're going for the, I mean, going with the quantum computer discussion. With quantum computing, I think uh, there's also another thing that you've 
mentioned in your content on TikTok and you know your uh, edu edu talk series it's about nook power i personally oh, yes. am an advocate of nook power here in the philippines but you know when you posted it there were some even some you know already some alarming responses <laughs> from tiktokers right yeah. so i yeah. guess yeah this, I, i'd like to explore that area quite a bit i think this is more of your alley because this sure, is of like course. Let's nook, go. nook physics i'd like to talk about the uh, possibility of a philippines of the philippines being a nuclear powered nation so i um, think it's possible yeah yeah uh could you because with quantum computing and the you know modern uh, nuclear technology and also with you know very smart people like you like you know in the forefront of all this um what do you think i mean just to get the you know to to clear i guess the fog and the smoke um because the but that if but a nuclear power plant i guess the way we're getting some sentiments that no it's gonna be another waste of money it's gonna be another but a nuclear power plant and we got the fukushima and stuff and all of that um but uh from from your perspective like the modern technology that we have um the viability of uh nuk nuk power in the philippines what are your thoughts on that for the philippines to be nuclear powered but our biggest our biggest struggle and the biggest hindrance to us is actually the misinformation in the public would you believe that there was a survey done a few years back where they asked um what among these topics are you most in favor of and what are you most not in favor of and would you believe that like like number three the third top the number three topic top three topics sorry that most people are against is the construction of power plants nuclear power plants and you know what numbers one and two are can you make a guess what topics that they're um or rather issues that they're against like they don't want this to be approved they don't want this to be legalized number three the top third mm -hmm. thing that they don't that they are against mm -hmm. is the construction of nuclear power plants in the country so to give you an idea of just how much they don't want can you guess what numbers one and two are i would bet one would be divorce and same-sex marriages <laughs> I would no bet. actually that's lower that's lower oh shit really what are the, what are the one and one and two number one is the construction of more coal plants in the country and number two is allowing vloggers and content creators in malacanang Okay. So if you can imagine, those are the top two, and then it's already nuclear. The construction of a nuclear power plant. Ridiculous at this age. Yes. the The thing is, it would be hard. Again, our biggest issue would be getting the public to approve of this, because of course, since there's when you think of nuclear power, what do you think of? You think of like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Fukushima, and you get this bad idea about nuclear physics. And I think that would be our biggest hindrance: people protesting and not wanting our tax money to be used on a nuclear power plant. But what's really funny is that do you know that currently there are over a hundred nuclear power plants in use around the world, providing the world's energy? Wow. There's over a hundred. And can you name me how many nuclear power plant accidents have you heard of? Well, the ones you mentioned, I guess the most popular would be for me Chernobyl and Fukushima. In recent memory, that's honestly the the I guess well spread in the media, well covered. Here's the thing: there's less than ten, less than five actually, but I'm gonna say ten in case I'm forgetting any. But less than ten major accidents. And that is such a small, small, small percentage of nuclear power plants that have melted melted down. It's kind of like you know, like maguhugot mo na ako dito. Like you know, in a relationship, when you do so much good, but they forget all of that and they just remember the small mistakes you did. 
it's kind of like that. Like, there's so much good that nuclear power does for the Philippines. No, for the world, sorry, not the Philippines. There's so much good that nuclear power has done. But what sticks to people's memories are the bad things that happen with nuclear energy, completely forgetting the tens of hundreds that actually are successful and are operating without fail and helping so many people around the world. Perhaps it's also like, yun nga, yung bataan. It was like really some sort of, I guess, attempt in the, you know, during the past na to transition to nuclear energy for the people and yet it failed. So, um, I guess, with all this sinasabi mo nga, the misinformation and I guess yung education ng like the, you know, the common people kung how nuclear energy can help develop our country. Because I agree. I mean, one of the major, major uh, <laughs> constraints natin dito, that's why we are, we are experiencing such a slow progress towards industrialization is the energy costs. Diba? If you lower the cost oh, yes. of energy, then you make manufacturing more cost-efficient. And when you make manufacturing cost-efficient lower, then, di ba, mas magiging mura, mura lahat. I mean, it will trickle down yung cost. So, so mas, mas maraming magiging reserve, uh, I guess, reserve uh, resources ang mga common tao that they can invest in something mm-hmm. else instead of like really worrying na napakataas ng prices ng electricity, napakataas ng prices ng transportation, and all of that. So, um, ano pa ba yung like strengths and opportunities I guess ng nuclear energy para sa atin dito if ever ma-decide natin na mag-set up tayo ulit and just try again. I think it's it's time din eh kasi within yeah. we're, we're we're in the age of AI. I would bet na ang nuclear power plants sa itatayo natin is not like yung nuclear power plants na tinayo sa bataan nung 1960s. Oh definitely, definitely. Um, ang ginagamit nilang pan-design doon is I guess lapis or T-squares or like mga, mga ganong stuff, right? But now, we got like supercomputers, we got AI, we got for monitoring, construction and such. So, yeah, any advantages pa ba na nakikita mo and opportunities sa atin if we adopt nuclear energy here in our country? Here's the thing. Nuclear energy, our fuel, the uranium pellets, they're so small. And they're able to power so, so much more than regular fuel. And that, and the thing is that it's clean energy. So therefore, we're going to have not just f- cheaper energy, but we'd also have less waste. So we can even have better air quality for it. Another thing about one of the big advantages of nuclear energy is that the land use is a lot less. I don't know if you've ever seen a wind farm. Yeah. So- yeah, wind farms, they take up so much space. Whereas nuclear energy, you just need one one structure and then everything is there already. You don't need those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square meters of land just to generate an electricity. You can do it in one facility only. And I think that's a huge advantage in the Philippines, especially where we can be a little pressed for space. So other people can use that space for other purposes so we can further further grow as a country while we're powering everything. And not just that, um, not just nuclear power, because just knowing more about nuclear physics, because did you know that radiation and nuclear physics is also used in agriculture and in medicine? Mm, wow. Okay. So, if like, I can medicine, go a little off topic here. Yeah, I mean, Sorry. medicine, a bit familiar with it, like uh, nuclear medicine, right? Because my dad had his like, cancer treatment in the past and they used some like nuclear medicine technology to detect and, you know, the modern stuff. But agriculture, girl, this is the first time. Okay. Nuclear energy and agriculture by all means. I'm all ears. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So did you know that when you bring in, let's say, sacks of rice or sacks of a harvest, also I, I apologize in advance if I'm, I'm a little erratic in talking because my dog is kind of running around and, and I'm talking, I'm trying to get his mouth off of things. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, when you bring in large sacks of produce, do you know that you have to irradiate those to get rid of the small bugs and the little um, dirt inside it, the little contaminants inside it? Because you could put that through extreme heat, but that can destroy the crops. But then if you irradiate it, that will not 
cause any harm to the crops, but it will get rid of any bugs or any contaminants inside it. And they use that in agriculture. Also, PNRI was able to develop this kind of um, new plant grower. It's called VitaGrow, wherein the, they're able to use radiation to be able to make the plants grow bigger and faster. Whoa, it's like a mini sun, you're saying. This what a, it like not really, a really it's tiny... not a mini sun. It's not a mini sun, it's a spray on thing. Oh, okay. I thought it was like you something you put in like a uh, an industrial no, farm no. that parang like oh like it's a spray on tapos ray what what's the name again? Sorry, I, I have to write Vita that down. Grow. Vita Wait, let grow. me just double check. Vita Grow. Let me just check my files. I because gotta, I know I have a file on it here. Wow. I got to check that out because I do indulge in some gardening, you know, like taking care of plants, watching them grow. I mean, I fancy myself as like, you know, a, a gardener with some geeking out. But yeah, Vita Grow. And is this is available now in the market? Like this is nuclear energy available for... Is this like industrial or even if like, you know, common people it's like It's for me. agricultural purposes. I believe you can buy it already, but I'm not sure. I'm still, sorry, I'm still looking for the file that I have on it because I mm. do have a file on it. All right. Well, yeah, just good. While you're fiddling with your uh, files over there. So like... Vital agri- Grow. Vital Grow. Vital Grow. Oh, all right. Maybe I'll, I'll include the the link in the description so our listeners will be able to uh, check that out too for themselves. And this is developed yeah. by Pinoy's, mga kababayan natin. This yeah, so it's a carrageenan-based special foliar fertilizer and inducer of resistance to pest and disease with micronutrients. And it was manufactured by the WZ Corpor- Corporation and in partnership with BNRI. Wow. So Whoa. we do have that. We do have that. Hooray science. And ano to? I mean, again, hindi siya pang like large-scale farming lang, right? Since it's a spray on, I guess you can like put, this is available as like parang, you know, the spray bottles and such. Would yeah, they're in spray bottles actually. Wow. Wow. Because when you said spray, I think, di ba parang drone spray sa malalaking farms. But if this is available... For like just you know the ano bang scale nito consumer level and and user yeah. like consumer level and this will be I think a really good alternative for like I guess uh what you call it pesticides and such mm-hmm. right because so it's I found, not chemical I found my file. yeah I found my file on it and so basically it's a foliar fertilizer produced using modern nanotechnology. So it's a plant growth promoter solution that helps, in, it can actually increase rice production by at least a fifth of the average yield. Not just that, it offers protection against infestation and storms. Damn, and that's nuclear energy. I wonder how they developed it. It's just like, how, how, how? And and it's also developed for like, I mean, it's not high technology. It's some basic technology like food production, food security. So with yeah. knowledge of nuclear, you know, nuclear uh, science, it's like we can secure more food for the people and such, you know, get more energy like with the nuclear power plant. And what you're saying, ano pa yung sinasabi mong isa? It's like with the, with the agriculture, agricultural part, and the other one is like the uh, industrial part. Is there like a possibility in a, like, because when you say nukes, like I'm, I'm going to go off track with the agriculture stuff a bit, but it's really interesting. Is like, um, since we're getting pushbacks for like the adoption of nuclear power in the Philippines, since in isip ko rin dito, like as a common man, is just like a huge nuclear reactor being built and it's a centralized would it be possible na like construct a like smaller one like let's say a size of a house and then you get like some micro uh, micro nuclear reactor is that like a possibility for us or would you rather think na just build one big reactor and supply the whole 
like town or province? At this point, I think it's better for us to have a regular PWR or a pressurized water reactor because the thing is that we are very, very new to nuclear to the nuclear field and we're very new to using nuclear physics. And I think at this point, we can't afford to take any risks. So I don't know if we have the capability to handle micro reactors. I think it would be best for us to start with a regular PWR reactor. PWR reactors are the most common type of reactors used in the world. And there's a wealth of knowledge on them. So many countries are using them. So it would be easier for us to get the support needed to be able to use nuclear power effectively if we go, if we go with something that, you know, we already have a lot of background on. And there's a lot of literature on. And we can go to other countries for help if anything happens. I think that would be best. Instead of going for micronuclear, we could go for the most common type of reactor first. Mm, but is there, like, I, I would bet there's already some research on how to, like, miniaturize these reactors yes. yeah like what countries right now are off of the like uh top of your head like you know who are uh countries that are uh on the research and how to like miniaturize nuclear reactors um i wouldn't know much about the miniaturizing portion but i can say that one of the leaders right now in nuclear physics is japan japan Wow. My training was actually done in accordance with, in partnership with JAEA or Japan Atomic Energy Association. How did that go? Could you like tell the story of your experience? Um, was it like an internship or it was like a, what, what, what sort of collaboration was that? It's not an internship. It's a training program. I was with, I was so privileged to be with other people who are very much in this field. I was with, for example, a safety engineer of BNPP. I was with a senior engineer also of BNPP and other professors. What they do is, what they did rather was that we had online classes on various topics related to nuclear engineering. And then we had, for the final part, we had face to face classes where we would actually hands on on learning in the reactor, hands on learning, going to different facilities and understanding how to do reactor engineering. Hmm. How like right now, since we're at, at zero nuclear reactors here, like we're how... not at zero nuclear reactors. Mm-hmm. Oh really? Please. We uh... have a nuclear reactor. Go ahead, please tell me more. We have one. It's called the Sater. It's located within PNRI. Um, do you know that big egg in Commonwealth? Big egg I don't in ever Commonwealth. Seen... There's Common... like a big egg. It's just like in Quezon City, like near UPD, there's just like this big egg out of nowhere that oh, you can see on the street. Malapit sa tourism, I guess. Sa College of Tourism. I think, I think. Sa... there's like this huge egg. I think I saw it. I thought it was like some astronomical <laughs> facility or something. But that was a, that's a nuclear reactor, you're saying? That's a that... reactor. That's a reactor. What, what do they do there? Uh, curious. That is a research reactor. So... When you say reactors, I think what most people think about is like Chernobyl, Fukushima, but there's two types. A nuclear power plant is, its main goal is to provide people with electricity. A nuclear research reactor is, you know, as the name implies, it's for research, it's for training and education to find out more about how neutrons work so that we can further progress in our discoveries and be able to harness nuclear energy better. What we have is a nuclear research reactor. So it does not create energy, but it it creates neutrons and we could study that. And that is that big egg. So you're saying that by the and witness like a nuclear fission thing? It's under that part is a little underground i don't know if you you can't witness it but you could see the data from it oh the data i I, I see i i I don't think you want to witness it (laughs) why well for sources it could be very dangerous and it could create so much energy that could actually like kill you or something that's why it's kept in a very very tightly clad container that's why everything is like underground and everything is not really underground but it's very well sealed. But maybe I'll become like B- Bruce Banner. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Happen. Oh my goodness, please no. 
You know, there was one time. Um, did you know? Did you know that bananas are? Also, I'm so sorry if I keep going off tangent. I have ADHD. So, um, did you, did you know that bananas are radioactive? I just remembered. Why? How is it radioactive? A naturally occurring radioactive substance is potassium, and what has potassium? Bananas. Oh, like bananas, so, not just the peels, but. Like the whole thing? Yeah. So I feel like it's funny when people are so scared about radiation, but there is such a thing as natural radiation. And one source of that is bananas. <laughs> funny. I just funny. remembered it because you mentioned like, what if I turn into Bruce Banner? And I remember I told one person that, um, did you know that um, bananas have natural radiation because of potassium? And this one guy, he asked, so how many bananas do I have to eat to turn into a Hulk? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, like, but if you mention it, like, that's one of the first things that comes to my mind already because you were like, what if I turn into Bruce Banner? Oh my goodness, I remember that guy. So how many bananas do I need to eat to turn into the Hulk? Bro, it doesn't work that way. Well, now that you've asked it, in your estimation, how many bananas should one eat to be able to turn to Bruce Banner? Like, You'll let's probably do die some... before you. <laughs> the, the chances of you dying from like eating too many bananas is higher than you turning into Bruce Banner. <laughs> so, like a million or something. Probably like, uh... enough to kill you. Enough to kill you. <laughs> Death by bananas. Wouldn't that be like you know Darwin Award? That would be oh like God. the. That would be like <laughs> the headline. For the year 2023, man attempts to be Bruce Banner died from eating a million bananas in one sitting. Jeez, jeez. <laughs> wow, I thought I could witness some like really nuclear stuff happening. You'll see in the, the data. You'll see the, the data, data, though. The data. I was like, you know, I was, I was like in my head when you were when you were saying it, it was like oh maybe i can do a vlog and just really watch and you know watch you can do uh, a vlog actually um i don't think they'll allow you to watch it but you can also interview um doc alvi she's the head of the operations for the research reactor you can always contact pnri or if you want i can put you in touch with them wow thanks maybe one of these days because i'm not based in manila now so i'm based outside i have like uh I have I, I need to like set up my calendar, especially in this holiday season, like you know, with oh, yeah. all the adulting stuff, I think we all can relate. But perhaps thank oh. you. For, I'll take you on one of these yeah. days on that offer so I can, you know, visit the facility. Uh speak speaking of which, now that we have like a research facility, um, like how about uh researching because another thing is nuclear waste right if you're uh, mm, talking mm. about nuclear energy there's like waste and i watched okay. some uh, i watched one of your tiktoks and you were this i think this is very recent that one scientist said that there is a way to manage nuclear waste and me as a like you know a common guy i thought that it's still you know why don't we just hire elon musk and like um ship the waste to the sun <laughs> something, no! something like something like that so like managing nuclear waste in the modern times how how, how is it done i'm honestly not too sure because that's not my area of expertise but i do know that there is a waste management facility in pnri i can't speak much on it especially since that that is not something I'm trained in, but I do know that nuclear waste is there's a better way to manage nuclear waste now. Mm, I think you should make a part two of that TikTok. I'm dying to know. Maybe he I, says I'm it. actually I could interview him because I myself I'm not too well versed on nuclear waste management and I'd rather not spread misinformation on it. But sure, yeah, I guess I could you know, I could I could give you his contact if you want. You can have another episode with him on it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again, Frank. I mean, I'd appreciate it. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll give you his contact. I'll get in touch with PNRI. I can just let you know. Mm, thanks. 
because nuclear waste management i mean that, that's also like uh i watched a documentary i think it was the after the fukushima stuff happening they just piled it like in a field and just cover it with like i don't know some they, they just cover it it's, it's essentially just lying in the field and i'm just wondering if you said that land use over here were like press for land you know land area and so like you know how, where will the waste go will it dump into the ocean I, it feels like counter in, in counterintuitive but i think with fukushima they did that because it was an emergency mm, mm. sorry go on go on sorry yeah I, i i guess yeah that's that's the answer i was looking for it was an emergency i thought it was just like their standard operating procedure so oh, um, no. um fukushima remember the thing with fukushima is that it's not just that it broke out of nowhere because i think that's what most people think like how, how do you think fukushima happened human like as a layman error? just, just, human, just off the top just, of your head i think it was just humans human error Uh, someone, some employee just forgot, just maybe went sleepless, misconfigured stuff. I that's that's my that that's my you know parang kutob ko dun. But what really happened over there? There was an earthquake. That's what happened. There was an earthquake which resulted in a tsunami, which actually destroyed a whole part of Fukushima, not just the reactor. And just so happened that the reactor was in the area destroyed by the tsunami. So it's not so much of just human error; it's that there was a natural disaster, and the nuclear reactor was collateral damage. So one reason I think why they dumped everything in a field is because they weren't just worried about Fukushima, about the victims of the meltdown. They were worried about the hundreds and thousands being displaced by the tsunami. Lang. Mm. So even with or without the meltdown, would have still been disastrous because it was a tsunami. But we have learned a lot from Fukushima, and one of the reasons why the Fukushima meltdown was so bad is that they were using Western designs in the creation of the power plant. And as you know, um, in Western designs, they don't really take into account tsunamis, earthquakes. It's not really a thing that they worry about, right? Mm. Mm. So that's more of a ring of fire thing, and they did not take that into consideration. So ever since Fukushima, now new power plants have have been designed so that they can withstand tsunamis because it was a tsunami that did Fukushima in. I see. Mm. I, I like the the. It makes sense now that yeah, it was a tsunami. So whether or not there was like a nuclear power plant over there, there will be it like would have been so yeah, yeah, there will be like some destruction happening and all of that. Oh, oh yeah, but there was so much media coverage about the Fukushima and all of the. I mean, the Fukushima power plant that it kind of like overshadowed the whole tsunami thing. Yeah, yeah because that was the biggest issue, and plus, nuclear power is something that most people don't understand. And when you have that shroud of not understanding something, the unknown is very scary, and it causes a sensation. So I think that's why everyone just honed in specifically on the nuclear power plant because you don't understand that, and it's scary. Mm, definitely fear of the unknown the scariest of all right yeah uh, so like you mentioned something about design I'm pretty interested about this because the modern nuclear power plant I would think will be like uh, you know an upgrade especially you said you, we've learned from the all these disasters off the top of your head could you like let me in into like the since you you just also mentioned congratulations you just had your uh, certification for reactor engineering did i read that yeah. right in your tiktok so yeah design engineering of a modern nuclear power plant so i guess this is just also to educate our listeners uh what would be like uh What is your vision, or how could you lay it out? Like, you know, give give me a vision of what a modern nuclear power plant design is. Para dito sa atin. Okay, there are many this types of nuclear power plants, so I'm just gonna give one, if that's okay. So I mentioned a while ago about the PWR, right? Mm. A pressurized water reactor. So how that works is, um, you have one area there where you're having nuclear fission, right? And it's and it's just like, it's causing heat energy. So from there, there's water in that area. That's why it's got a pressurized water reactor, right? And then that water turns into steam and then goes through a tube where there's, 
where there's a fan, there's a hydro, there's a, a little fan that generates electricity. And then that steam is what makes that fan move to generate electricity. And then from there, it gets condensed, goes back down to the main water containment where the nuclear fission is taking place, gets heated up again, and then goes back, turns into steam to power that fan up. Mm. So that's basically how the most common, commonly used nuclear reactor works. So how about like, you know, just trying to put some, uh, I guess, sci-fi thing. How will, how do you think AI will play into like the construction of modern nuclear power plants? Hmm, that's a good question. I think, I suppose because AI has access to a lot of files and a lot of the signs from history that have both worked and not worked. I suppose AI could be used to figure out design flaws early on in the blueprint in the early stages. It can be used to further to put together the best parts of every design into maybe one mega best nuclear reactor. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. I'd like it to be, if you're just going to ask me, imagine it. I'd like it to be just a robot. It's just a one robotic nuclear reactor where you could just push a button and then to... wait, I'm sorry, what do you mean? <laughs> and then it was just self monitoring and then the you know, like a, a robot building. It will tell you you got like you put the nuclear reactor somewhere, there's no people working there unless it's gonna be like maintenance or like, you know, entirely computerized stuff. You can just monitor it from far away. Like how they do it with, I don't know, the space stations or something like that, and then just let AI do its thing. Do AI regulates the thing, AI starts the thing, AI shuts it down if there's like it detects some, I guess, tremors, earthquake tremors or something like that. But do, is that re feasible now? Do you think, or am I just imagining sci-fi? Not now. Sci not now. Not, sci now. Stuff? not now. Maybe, maybe in the future. I mean. I, I'd like to stay open-minded and not completely shut down something. I mean, years ago, they said airplanes were impossible. But as we know, they're very possible now. So I won't say that that's impossible, but I don't think that's possible now. Mm -hmm. Maybe like, in the future. For now, yeah. I think we have to focus on perfecting it. I see. Future, like 100 years, 50 years, 20? I'm something. not sure. Probably 50 50, 50 ish. I'm not sure. Don't wow. don't quote me on that. I mean, you could keep that in, but like, don't quote me on that. <laughs> well, that's so good. Rough ass, you know? We're just playing around with the DS anyway. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. all good. Uh, but yeah, it would it would be like quite a scene to witness. Years, like, fifty years. Not not so sure, but uh, all I could say is that I don't know if that's possible now. Mm, okay. All right. Fair enough. Uh, last part for all this nuclear reactor. Talk uh, before I, you know, before I move on because we're, you know, papa sarap usapan natin and I know you're pressed for time. Um, f uh, nuclear fusion. I've read in some sources the nuclear fusion has been done. It's like in a really, really like the the uh, smallest scale. Okay, so this is really exciting. Okay, so right now what we do is nuclear fission and nuclear fission. It means that you're splitting an atom to create to create neutrons because when you bombard a material, it splits into two atoms and releases neutrons, which have a neutral electron, a, a neutral charge, and it's those neutrons that you use as energy. And so far, or at least up to last year, it was thought that that's like the only way you could create energy is by splitting the atom. Because are you familiar with strong force and weak force? Don't remember it yet, but strong nuclear forces is if I remember cor uh, correctly during my you know school days, it's one of the strongest na natural forces. Yeah, nuclear bond. and that's what's holding the atom together. So when you're spinning the atom, you are releasing all that force, all that energy, and that's how you create energy through nuclear fission. But as of last year, they were they found out that it is possible to create energy through nuclear fusion. Fusion naman, is when you combine two, at two atoms together. So that actually could generate like four times more energy than nuclear fission. 
at the moment they still don't know how to harness it but we're getting there and that's so exciting isn't it like how the sun works yep or- yep, yep nuclear fusion is what powers the sun and it's when nuclear nuclei they com- they collide with each other at like really high temperatures and it has to be this temperature it has like enough temp it has enough energy because you know how usually um they're going to repel each other right that's normally how it goes yes but the when you have extremely high temperature that has so much energy that it overcomes that natural repulsion so that gives you an idea of just how powerful nuclear fusion is and that creates the energy it's totally different from like uh the fission where you just it's 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 uh, if, if i think about it now fission is kind of like destructive you know a destructive method of yeah, obtaining kind of. energy it's like yeah you split the atom and then you release all the energy that's been holding the atom together wow how many years again just playing around you know you won't get canceled for this i don't think so <laughs> nuclear fusion energy reactors How many Maybe around years? 50, 20 to 50, 20 to 50 years. 20 to 50 years before we figure out how to actually work it, I think. Because we, we were just able to make breakthroughs last year. So around 20 to 50 years, hopefully. Wow. Wow. Really fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Well, that's, uh, you know, I, you I know guess... How much, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you yeah, know you how saying. much energy you can create with nuclear fusion? It's just like we're just like very very few like fossil, not fossil to like, but very little fuel. I'll just use the word fuel to people who understand what I'm talking about. I don't mean actual fuel. I'm talking about the stuff that react that reacts to mm. create this reaction. So with very little reactants, or do you know that you can create around enough energy for one person to use over 60 years? Wow, how small again? Yung kailangan lang? Like, just very few grams of reactants. Like, um, if I remember correctly, I think it's tritium and deuterium. I think it's tritium and deuterium. Someone just search if it's correct. But off the top of my head, I know it's tritium and deuterium. You just need a few grams of that. And then that creates enough energy for a single person over 60 years. It's like a lifetime, yeah? It's just a few grams. Yeah. Wow, so efficient. That is so efficient. Yeah. So, ano yung like risks ng fusion then? If like, what's what's waste? What's the waste product of uh, fusion? Okay, fusion's waste product is helium, and that makes it super clean. Plus, we're in the middle of a helium store of a helium shortage right now. So, it actually, it's two birds with one stone. Yeah, you can just harness the waste product and reuse that, repurpose it. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. So, so it I could guess... also so not only could we create more energy it solves the helium shortage and i know what you're probably thinking like oh what, what do you need helium for for like balloons or something we're gonna all gonna like speak in high-pitched voices um the thing is that did you know that helium is actually what they use in mri machines oh no did not know that i thought it was just like yeah. all electricity and stuff um mri machines have magnets in them and you need to keep those running with helium So if we're in the middle of a helium storage, which means that it could be difficult to, you know, keep running MRI tests, which people need, of course, for medical purposes. So if we're able to harness nuclear fusion with its waste product being helium, that hits two birds with one stone. We get to have, we're able to provide medical services to more people while simultaneously being able to provide more electricity and more energy for everyone. Yeah, the future is going to be you know bright with all this nuclear fusion technology like i hope so i hope i get to still live the day to see like the first yeah. you know f- first uh, even micro i guess micro reactor of fusion energy uh, being developed and deployed um just to uh, you know switch gears a bit with all these you know educational stuff that you have right now it's part of your passion let's go a bit about your content creator journey at tiktok like you do edu talk and in a twist of fate again beauty talk edu talk beauty talk so you started your tiktok channel what's you know right now it's it's still you know gaining 
tons of engagement and tons of attention and i can see na yung sentiment ng viewers is like really positive and i admire you for it that you are taking an effort to educate the audience and to get like like you said para ma-dispel yung kung ano man uh, misconceptions about the adoption of nuclear energy and you know just pointing out you know like i guess the fog of war just shooing away the fog of war um do you have special productivity or discipline habits when you try to create content for your edutalk channel what i do with edutalk because i'm aware that i have a big platform and i'm aware that a lot of well some people may take their information solely from my videos and i believe one of the biggest problems and challenges today is misinformation so whenever i create content even if i already know the answer off the top of my head i always make sure to check and double check it i have a bunch of books that i used for physics so i always double check that i make sure everything is correct before i post anything if you're wondering how i do my how i choose what topic to make for that day actually is i have a book um it's called young and friedman for me it's one of the best physics books out there if and if you guys you need a good physics book i highly recommend university physics by young and friedman anyway it covers everything from classical mechanics all the way to quantum mechanics what i'll do is that i'll just open it to a random page and i'll be like okay i guess we're doing collisions today mm-hmm. awesome approach yeah. i like it i like it awesome mm-hmm. approach Um, it's random enough, but makes sense enough. So you get really exciting content for, you know, your TikTok community. Any challenges, special challenges when you get started, like doing this type of content for your TikTok channel? I felt like people aren't very interested to watch educational videos. Even if they're in short form, because I mean, you go on TikTok to like get a break from life, and then when you get on TikTok, like, oh, my studies are here again. <laughs> It's following me, so I'm constantly having to come up with ways to simplify it and make it more fun and entertaining. Hence, why I do like get ready with me while talking about physics, because get ready with me, get ready with me. Those are very popular, especially among female viewers. And the great thing about it is that it's constantly moving. So it's not just a talking head, wherein I might as well just be your teacher. You know, why don't you just go to class instead of listening to me? So I am constantly finding ways to keep it fun and engaging and entertaining for the viewers. And I think that's a really big challenge, as well as simplifying it, because there are just some things that I feel it's it's easier to explain things in their most complicated form. I feel because it's like you don't need to further explain complicated. Complicated concepts and just say like, yeah, this, this, this. But actually simplifying it and making sure everyone can understand it is for me the hardest part. Also, other than keeping it engaging. Mm, I bet because it's really, yeah, like you said, ano she, hardcore topic she, and you know, going to TikTok to relax and then you get some educated <laughs> talk. But I guess the that's just the algorithm playing its game. I guess, um, and it also helps the mandin nga if like. Like personally, me, I like bigla na lang napunta sa TikTok yung napunta sa TikTok. But like you were explaining, I think it was Oppenheimer, the way back. Yeah, you were, you were no. reacting to Oppenheimer. I'd like to talk more about it though, but maybe in another episode because we're let's pressed go. for time. We're pressed oh, for let's time. Let's go. Let's go. I have time. Yeah, no, but, I have time. I have time. I have time. <laughs> but um, uh, I guess this is gonna be like. Just two more questions. Two more questions for me. Sure. Um, number one, this is kind of fun, all right? Because um, you, you reserve kuna sa dulo yung like a more serious uh, stuff for like your words of wisdom for the listeners. At this age, with your like physics background and such, what are your thoughts about people who believe still na flat ang Earth? Bro. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Bro. I'm not even gonna try. Bro. <laughs> That's all you need to say. All right. Enough Bro. said then. Enough yeah. said. Enough said. Enough said. All right. 
<laughs> okay, then I'll move on to my final question for you. You know, Because... I know a pilot who thinks the Earth is flat. Okay, a pilot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Just... If, if you're if you're going to think that, I don't think any amount of convincing or any science or any pictures is going to convince you anymore. So just. Whatever makes you sleep at night, bro. <laughs> there was this uh, actually there was this other video nga na, uh, he tried to prove that the earth is flat. Uh, he used like some sort of <laughs> yung oh, ano to yung ginag- ginagamit ng geodetic engineers. Because I was using yeah, some he bought expensive equipment. He used the science to prove the earth is flat. Uh, but the earth but then it proved that the earth was round. <laughs> Yeah, it was, and his conclusion was like, "Well, that was interesting. That was interesting." It was like, bro. I bet there's a problem with the equipment I use. Bro, it was, it must bro. be human error. Yeah, most probably. Yeah, some videos about that was just so satisfying to watch. I mean, come on, people, it's 2023, bro. We got nuclear fusion coming in now. Come on, Earth. Come on. And it's so funny how that person believes in the science of those instruments, but he won't believe in the science of the pictures of the Earth. <laughs> They knew this since Aristotle or something. Since the day of Aristotle, the the Earth, is Archimedes. Magellan. Or, yeah, no, more Arch- Magellan. Aristotle <laughs> thought the Earth was flat. Oh, I think. really? Oh. Did he? I think. So it's like Magellan proved the Earth was round. I, I mean, I, wasn't that the point of his of his voyage? No, I think Magellan just wanted some spice. He just wanted to like go around the world. Was like the the king of Portugal was like, hey, I mean, the king of Spain, yeah, the Philip. He said that, yeah, oh, just go to an expedition, go to like spice islands. I heard this thing called uh-huh. Molucas. And then just go. And Magellan was like Portuguese. He can't get some Portu- Portuguese uh, sponsors to get his voyage, uh, you know, started. So he went to Spain. And I think that's just it. Spice and then Christianity and then gold, I guess. That was, but, you know, tough luck for him because... He okay, went- <laughs> I checked it. I stand corrected. Aristotle. Yeah. Also, I stand corrected. Aristotle believed the earth was round. You know, Aristotle thought the Earth was round. Why do? What it makes it so hard? Like, like his reasoning why it's round? Because I double checked it. I was like, I know they thought he was it was flat at the time, but let me just double check it. Because you no, know, I always have to double check everything, especially when it's on a platform. I double checked it, and it says here that Aristotle believed the Earth was round, and the reason for that is like if you if you like throw a bunch of of heavy bits of terrestrial material and they fall in the center of the universe, it's naturally going to be a sphere. No, that was a uh, wow. There was some sophisticated stuff he already like figured out during those times. Wow. Yeah. It just without... and like the during a, a lunar eclipse, the shadow is round, so it's gotta be round. And here's another thing about this round Earth, flat Earth thing happening. Oh, it was man. like the other planets round, the moon is round, the sun is round, Earth. <laughs> Flat. Flat. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Kung saan ka masaya? Yeah. Yeah. And these are the people that don't get canceled online. So it was just the world is a really fascinating place. Kung saan ka masaya? Whatever makes you sleep at night, like you said. All right. Now of these flat earthers, it's just you know they, 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 we we've had their fun. Final question for you for the day. What is one thing I like to ask this question? One thing that your followers, your listeners, your viewers should understand if they decide to follow the same path that you chose for yourself, being a content creator, physicist, and you know, and uh, also a daughter of the arts, and becoming you know successful with it. I'd say it's get out of your comfort zone, and the biggest thing is don't be intimidated by the math. Um, I say get out of your comfort zone, especially in math, because you know I wasn't good at math before. How did you survive? Um, 
<laughs> a lot of crying. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, don't get intimidated by the math. As long as you stick to it, just do a lot of practice and believe in yourself, really. Um, if you're scared of math, the math can feel that. So don't let it know you're scared. <laughs> and just attack it head on like a monster and just stick with it. I know the math can be intimidating, but there's so many resources out there. Don't, f- don't be afraid to ask for help. And practice a lot. Practice makes perfect. And it's like the one thing that can help you. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's it. <laughs> yeah, pretty, you know, pretty concise, succinct summation. Thanks for that. I hope the listeners, all right, to the listeners, you heard that straight from her, uh, from Frankie, all right, what you needed to do. Um, Frankie, thanks for uh, answering my questions and being patient with me uh, for this session. Thank you so much, too. Any promos, any gigs you need to, you know, you want to promote that the audiences would all like right. to hear so, from you? Check out my TikTok, Francesca Palabrica on TikTok and also please check out my web series Circuit Rikit on YouTube. Circuit Rikit, it's more on interviews with rising stars of Philippine science and technology and you'll learn more about where we are as a nation in terms of development. Wow, yeah. Um, would like to also ask you more about Circuit Rikit but I think yeah, that's, uh, that's another huge wide topic that we can explore because um, I'd like to also know about, you know, you have scientists and developments in the science and technology uh, field dito sa Pinas natin. Well, yeah. Um, anything else, Frankie, to promote? Gigs. Like, I don't know, you got a store. That's or all I have for now. That's all I have for now. Well, I'm, go- I'm starting my own small business, so look out for that. That's all I'll say. Would love to hear more about your small business in another episode, then, because in also, I'd episode. Like, yeah, I'd like to also know how you know how entrepreneurs develop and grow their businesses to inspire you, mga listeners, natin to you know just work on themselves better, work in making the community better. So yeah, for the listeners, this has been another episode of the podcast. So we'll see you next time.